Um, my name is Isaac May, and I'm the social media strategist here at Pew Research Center. I'd like to welcome all of you to our first ever Twitter space, where we will be discussing the future of the metaverse. Joining me is our moderator and co-host, Lee Rainey. Lee Rainey is the director of internet and technology research at Pew Research Center, which studies the social impact of digital technologies. Some of the research he pursues involves extensive canvassing of technology experts about the future of the internet. And the report we'll be discussing today about the future of the metaverse came from the most recent expert canvassing. His co-host and longtime research partner is Professor Jana Anderson from Elon University's Imagining the Internet Center. So Jana and Lee, thank you so much for joining us and co-hosting. Take it away. Hey, thank you so much, Isaac. And hello, everyone. I'm delighted to see you all. And I um, am so pleased to have so many of my uh, friends and contributors to our report um, showing up here. I'm I'm delighted to be part of this event, especially with Jan Anderson from Elon's University's Imagining the Internet Center. Uh, this past winter, we went to our expert respondents and asked them for their views about the future of the metaverse by the year 2040. So we're asking them to project a, a bit into the future. We specifically asked whether a sophisticated, fully immersive metaverse would be a key part of daily life for a significant part of the global population. And all told, about 624 experts responded, uh, and they split quite evenly. About half thought a well-functioning and fully immersive metaverse would be an aspect of daily life for many people, and about half thought such a metaverse would not have that role in daily life. Professor Anderson is going to run down some of the core arguments that both sides made in our report, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Jana. Thanks, Lee. There were four big themes expressed by those who said they do expect a well-functioning and much more broadly adopted metaverse to be a key part of daily life by 2040. First, they said profit mo motives will drive huge investment in the rapid development of extended reality spaces, access, and tools due to the commercial possibilities. They said that technology, the software, hardware, user interfaces, and network capability to create an immersive universe is possible by 2040. They said the COVID-19 pandemic gave XR development a boost as more people became more accustomed to immersing themselves in online interaction. And they said that the metaverse will be developed enough to be a truly useful place in people's lives in many new settings by 2040. Now, among the major themes expressed by those who think a widely adopted and well-functioning metaverse will not emerge by 2040, well, they don't expect that people will find it to be useful in daily life, and they think it'll remain a niche space for a limited number of activities, much as it is now. They expect that the necessary software, hardware, user interface, and network improvements and capacity will not be available or affordable by 2040. Uh, they said that humans generally will continue to prefer to live their lives in real reality. Thus, they'll stick to using augmented or mixed reality layers rather than full immersion in VR. And they said that fully immersive spaces will magnify all of the problems already arising out of digital life today. And they also predicted that people may avoid engaging in spaces that are operated in the surface of surveillance capitalism and open to abuse by authoritarian regimes. Well, today we've invited some of the best and brightest respondents from that expert group to join in a lively conversation, and it's their turn to elaborate on their views. We'll start with Avi Barzeev, a metaverse development pioneer who has been writing and speaking about these issues for years. Avi, will you please introduce yourself and take about five minutes to walk us through some of your ideas about the future of the metaverse? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I've been working in the field of what we call XR now for about 30 years. Started with uh, Disney early on, even a startup before that, and um, had the opportunity to contribute at Microsoft on the HoloLens and Amazon on Echo Frames and Apple on things I can't talk about. Um, and also helped start um, Keyhole, which turned into Google Earth and worked on Second Life. So I've kind of been all over the place and worked on a little bit of this and that and have interest in, in all of it. Uh, you can kind of think of me as a, as a um, computer architect and designer. Uh, and so I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. And, and one of the things that I like to say is I, I understand all the people who are coming at this new because I remember 30 years ago when I came at this new and was very excited. But just remember that I've had 30 years of, of you know, getting arrows in my back and bloodied and trying everything and seeing what works and doesn't work. So I'm kind of coming from the voice of, of, of good and bad experience at this. 
So what I what I um, saw about you used a bunch of the, the, the quotes from things that I've I've written, and it would take way more than five minutes to even just to read the quotes that you included. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to try to summarize in just a few bits and pieces um, of, of what I was trying to say. Uh, so the first thing I guess is when people say the metaverse is the fusion of the digital and the physical worlds, they're mainly talking about AR, right? They, Snow Crash's original metaverse, when, it, when he coined the term, was 99% VR. The headset could actually do AR, but nobody used it because reality was really bad. So everybody spent their time in VR because reality was so horrible, um, even though they could have done AR. But what, what AR is really about, I think, and what's important about it and why it's relevant to us is that it's really about how we interact with computers, reality, and other people all at the same time. It's this interface between all three. And, and VR is still important. It's, it's valuable, but it's about anything else. It's about anything other than the here and now, which is great for escapism and meetings and creativity, things like that. Um, exploring other worlds. But the reality is I think we're going to live fluidly between them. We're going to see devices coming out even next month that can switch between AR and VR. So it's never all one thing. Uh, but my kind of annoyance with the term metaverse, I don't know how to really describe this well, except to say it's akin to hearing somebody say that the solution to gender diversity and misogyny is to call everyone men. It, it's not really the solution to call everything the metaverse. There are differences among these things and the differences matter. That's why we have unique words like AR and VR to describe some of those differences and calling it all the same, I think uh, sort of hides the facts of, of what's important here. So AR has always been the future of computing and interaction. I think it's been that way since the beginning and a lot of people are more excited about VR. I was more excited about VR initially. I thought the internet had to be 3D to take off, but uh, clearly it didn't. Um, but I think the future of AR is really that we see holograms of, of each other. The people that we care about can be with us when we want them, even when they're not physically present. And it'll feel much more natural, I think, than anything else we've imagined. And even smart devices will have AR interfaces. This computer screen basically disappears and the world becomes our, our canvas. That to me feels much more natural as a vision. Uh, now, some people talk about wanting to live in VR, and this is where I start to have some concerns. Uh, because it's a form of escapism for some people, I think. It's it's akin to maybe easier than living on Mars, right? But it's about getting away from the, the restrictions of the world that we don't like. Uh, and the answer is, the question is, are we ready yet? Are we, are we ready for that? And I think judging by the fact that we can barely live together on Twitter today without blocking people, and that's all just text, I'd say, no, we're probably not ready for that yet because the, the levels of power we have over each other are going to be so magnified in, in virtual worlds that uh, we need we need much more maturity. We need much more empathy for other people to be able to live in that space together, even to get the benefits of all the things that we want. Um, for an example, um, I, I worked on a, uh, I wrote a patent anyway. I almost can't talk about any details, but I wrote a patent for how would you block people in VR? Like how would you actually deal with people who are harassing them other than these bubbles and things that we do today? And, and it turns out if you want to treat it the way Twitter does, which is you can block people and they disappear from your timeline, in, in a physical virtual space, uh, that would be really weird because not only would the person disappear, but all their contributions would disappear. If they, had, if they had built the floor you were standing on, that would disappear. So we wind up with something much more like a consensual reality where everybody just sees only what they agree to see. And that becomes very hard to reconcile. So the world itself becomes very hard to imagine how it's going to work when everybody is so superpowered and, and, and filter bubbles become the least of our worries at that point. Uh, it's not unsolvable, but if you look at the state of things today, a lot of people working on the metaverse, the virtual side, are re still busy recreating and solving problems from 20 years ago, the second life that Star Wars Galaxies had to solve. We, we haven't evolved past most of those things yet. We've added a whole bunch of new requirements uh, about ownership and things like that, um, but, but we haven't even solved the core of the interactions. I think so we have a lot of work to do. And I think first and foremost, we need to bring into these worlds, and this is true for AR as well, is, is real empathy, real seeing each other as, as people. Even the word avatar hides the fact that some fraction of the virtual people we see are real people with real emotions that we can very easily trample. And giving people superpowers, I think, makes it more likely that we will trample each other. We'll have it be much easier to do so. Just look at road rage, given cars, how easy it is for people to take out their aggressions on each other. Um, and it's not that we need, you know, ultra realism in, in, in humans or we want to blame the victims of the harassment for the abuse for being there in the first place. And neither one of those is, is the case. 
But being represented like a video game character, is that really helping us to see each other as people? What we need to do is really treat the so-called empathy machine uh, in a way that it's going to really create empathy and, and treat people as people. Okay, so let's, another thing I talked about was, was privacy in the ad model. So switching gears just a little bit in, 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 in the, to the, for the sake of time. Uh, the big, big red flags that we have is that we are about to have a near future. So Facebook is, Meta is about to release a product that likely has eye tracking reportedly. And uh, other biometric sensors have already been out for a while, but it, you've written a lot about eye tracking and, and the problems with it. And I think a lot of people get concerned and they want to regulate the technology. And what I, what I come at it is, let's not regulate the ads. Let's not regulate the tech first. We will if we have to, but what we should regulate is the business models. The business models that say right now that it's okay to abuse our privacy for, for profit. It shouldn't be okay. It should frankly be illegal for a company to collect information about us and then use it against us. Uh, we should, on the other hand, we should encourage companies to safely use the data they collect. The biometric data is valuable and useful, but they should be using it for our benefit. Like when your watch tells you to see a doctor, that's for the benefit of, of the wearer and something we should value and protect if, if people choose it. Uh, and protecting from third party access like hackers or governments is also in our best interest. So the security of the data is really important. Right now, the ad tech companies are acting like giving us better ads is some kind of a mitzvah, like, you know, like that's what we all really want and need. But if that was true, we'd all turn it back on on our iPhones. And I think most of us have, have privacy turned on instead. Uh, the, the claim is that the, daily, the data is freely co collected while we're in, like we're in public places, but that's not true anymore. The, when we go on these sites, everything's now encrypted. Everything is really much more of a private space. And they also claim that we've consented to giving this data when we join, but that's not true either because nobody reads the terms of service. The companies know we don't read the terms of service. It's, it's, a, it's a sham. So we need to really revisit this. And it's, it's this, this greedy lie of saying that we all are doing this because we want it. It's, it's just got to stop. If some people want it, great. They can, they can opt in for, for ads that, you know, that give them information. Personally, I'd rather pay for a site like Consumer Reports that tells me which products are good and which products are bad rather than living in a world of, of self-motivated advertising. But the, the danger now is that the eye gaze, eye gaze data that we're about to be giving over to the companies is so much more compelling in terms of being able to not only pick the ads that we see, but manipulate us into watching the ads and into believing the ads uh, and iterating through our likes in the world are essentially in a form of mind reading. Now is the time we really, really need to start uh, regulating the, the use of this technology and how it's used uh, against us. And the final thing that I'm going to say, I don't know if I'm over five minutes or not, stop me if I go too long, but this will just be in a couple of sentences. Um, we need to think about how we design these products. I think that one of the, while we may need regulation and we certainly need standards and a lot of other work needs to happen, one of the things I think is missing and one of the things that this, this new XR Guild that, that we're working on is trying to solve is to help raise the level of mentoring and education among all the makers of metaverse and XR technology, all the developers and writers and artists, designers, PMs, even the CEOs, trying to raise the level of understanding around what is ethical and what is in the interest of our, of our users and how to design properly. Some companies do spend a lot of time thinking about that and other companies seem to be continually surprised at how much people hate what they do. Uh, and I think we can help raise that level of understanding. They just don't teach this well enough uh, in school and I think we need to go back and actually help with that level of education. So we've started this thing called the XR Guild that is meant to help with that. So thank you for listening. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to say. Hey, Avi, thank you so much. That's a, that's a lot to chew on. Uh, we're going to hear next from Kelly Bates from the Interaction Institute of Social Change, who has many of the same doubts, uh, even more amplified in some cases uh, than you were also you were describing about the world of the super powered and the super surveilled and the, where empathy is challenged and privacy uh, it just has new domain. So, Kelly, why don't you uh, why don't you pick up on the, those threads of the conversation and tell us what you're thinking? Happy to. So I am someone who would be a user and I'm not in the technical space, but I'm president of a nonprofit national organization in the United States that is really about harnessing human interactions between people on a very, very uh, in-person level where we acknowledge that the way we collaborate effectively and powerfully and move through challenges as human beings and as a species is through our ability to bring our collective intelligences together in person. 
Now, that being said, throughout the pandemic, we had to evolve, right? So our work had to be done online. And so we had to adjust and we had to figure out how to bring that human interaction online and in a space. So we've learned a lot. And even in that, what we learned is many people still are not completely ready to be completely immersed in a a metaverse that's a complete virtual reality. So I I don't think we're ready and, and I don't think it will be fully immersive. Yet it will be timely it will bring great innovation and it will bring great despair. Uh, on the timely question, you know, having alternative universes that you can embed in can be very important and powerful. We saw that with the pandemic, the need for non physical space to access resources. So I used my organization as an example. We started bringing hundreds upon hundreds of people together on Zoom to try to mimic in-person online. And thank God for it. Thank God for us being super users of Zoom and having the ability to translate human practices, human psychology into a virtual sphere. So in an event of like a catastrophic event or crisis or something like a pandemic, in some ways it's timely to think about this kind of technology and to advance it. But even with that, as soon as people could, and, and as we see now, they are running back to the ability to be in physical space with each other, for physical touch, for the ability to see human eyes and to look in and see them sparkle and to get hugs and to talk in ways that allow people to really have meaningful conversations. So for example, we do a lot of work around equity and race, racial justice and you know, very hard to be in deep conversations like that if you're in a completely virtual space. That being said, the innovation possibilities are really powerful. I think around art and business and education, it it could be amazing to see what advancements that could occur in either an augmented space or a fully immersive space. I mean, as someone who's lost loved ones like many of you, I mean, I would love to immerse myself in a space where my family members before they die record messages, record things they think could happen in the future. And I could be immersed in a technology where I see them, feel an experience of them and hear their messages. I mean, like that would be amazing where I could experience art and I could do things and learn things in the event of a climate disaster or if I need to have that kind of solace. But on the despair side, what happens when you embed too much, right? We become alone. We become humans inside a portal and our mental health can be challenged. So I think we have to really address what kind of collaboration can we have, like real deep human collaboration if we're just immersed in a virtual space. I think people know those limitations and therefore wouldn't jump in that quickly. And I think mental health wise, we have to think about the ethics of what being in that kind of space can do, particularly if it's immersive and you're being encouraged to buy things or the person's being exploited in ways beyond what they even know or understand. And then the equity ethics, right? On the despair side, I mentioned mental health, the inability to collaborate effectively as human beings. You know, will money only get you access? You know, who's going to be building this? Is it going to be built with people who don't have resources and are thinking about how to design for the margins? Right now we have a society built on profit motive and capital, but sometimes there is deep limitation to what that can do and provide for people in these spaces. And if we don't design for people who are most impacted in times of crisis or or who are at the margins, they won't be able to fully participate in this or worse, might even be hurt by it. And I'm thinking about low income communities, communities of color who don't have access to technology at the same rates. And frankly, in their culture, want to be in proximity, physical proximity. I think about people with disabilities who are, you know, both helped by technology, but may be hurt if it's not appropriately accommodated for them. Uh, People for whom English and technology are not their first or most comfortable language, right? So I think those are things to think about. And then finally, adaptation. I just think it's going to be slower than we think. I mean, I think we made a leap with the pandemic around technology, but To go fully immersive or even something that's more of a 
virtual reality. I think younger generations can adopt quicker, but like Facebook, where if you remember, you know, the millennials came on first, right? Then the generation Xers, then the boomers, right? It was like, it took a while for each generation to adapt. So I think eventually, maybe it's not 2040, maybe it's, you know, 2048 or, you know, or something like that. By that point, either the older generations that are not used to technology will have passed on or those generations will all be on. Um, but I think there'll be a process of upheaval and tension before this can emerge. Frankly, I think the climate crisis could be that thing. If like the pandemic, it creates such, such insecurity that people are um, afraid to leave their homes in different ways and we have access to technology and we bridged more of the digital divide, then I think something like this could be a lifesaver for some people. And um, finally, I'll just say, whatever we do, I think it needs to be aligned with, with a global plan, commitment to equity, our mental health, and we continue necessary physical human interaction as a part of it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, that was so strong. Um, we're going to hear now from Louis Rosenberg, who's been in the space for a, a good amount of time. And it was so striking to me that, that both Avi and Kelly were talking about ethics. And this is something that, Lewis, you've been thinking about for a, a long while. And you made a couple of predictions about it in, in your comments in our um, report. So uh, take it away. Uh, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Lewis Rosenberg. I've been uh, involved in the metaverse uh, now for over 30 years, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, I, uh, I started as a researcher at, at Stanford and NASA working on virtual reality vision systems. I was immediately captivated by the, by the possibilities. Uh, at the same time, I immediately felt like uh, myself and potentially other people uh, would not want to be uh, cut off from the real world. And what I really wanted to do is take the power of virtual reality and splash it all over the real world. And uh, I pitched that to the US Air Force and was lucky enough to have them uh, fund me to build uh, what was really the first interactive augmented reality system that allowed people to reach out and interact with real and virtual objects for the first time. And, uh, and I was so uh, impressed by how excited people got, even when with the crude systems back then, that in 1993, I founded uh, a virtual reality company, Immersion Corporation, uh, that uh, is actually still around today. It's going to be 30 years old uh, next, next year. Uh, in 2004, I founded an augmented reality company, uh, Outland Research. And then uh, in 2014, uh, I founded an artificial, in artificial intelligence company, uh, Unanimous AI. And, and I point that out because I think those, those three things are really a part of the metaverse. Virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, I think they all become central to the metaverse. And, um, and so with, with that said, what, what I wrote for the report uh, is that I, I predicted that, that by 2040, people will look back and laugh at images of the 2020s that show people walking down the street, staring down at little screens in their hands with their necks bent, bumping into things. And, and I say that because the metaverse will transform the way we interact with information. It'll take it off of screens and put it naturally into the world around us, spatially arranged in the way that our perceptual system was meant to perceive it. Uh, and to me, that's the core of the metaverse. In fact, I would define the metaverse as this societal transition that's just starting from a world where most digital content is viewed in the third person as flat media to a world where most content is engaged in the first person as immersive experiences. And, and this is really a profound change. It's the change of the, the role of the user from a viewer to a participant of content. Um, in terms of how I see it impacting society, I really see it evolving in two directions at once that, that I would refer to as the virtual metaverse and the augmented metaverse, which will have a lot of overlap, uh, but will also emerge at different rates and have different players and different business models. And so I think it's, it's really helpful to think of, think of these two things separately because they, they really will evolve and come out of uh, slightly different places. The, the virtual metaverse will be fully virtual worlds where people are represented as avatars. Many people think of this as the main metaverse uh, that will impact our lives. Uh, I disagree. Uh, it sounds like from obvious comments, he disagrees as well. Um, again, my personal experience is, uh, you know, from, from decades ago is that we humans don't like to be cut off from the real world for extended periods. 
uh, for a few hours. Uh, it's a great escape for entertainment, education, shopping, watching virtual sports. But I don't, I don't believe people will spend their daily lives in the virtual metaverse. I mean, maybe hardcore gamers, uh, maybe you know, uh, small, small sets of people, but not the majority of the people. Uh, on the other hand, the augmented metaverse, uh, that's going to be the real world embellished with virtual content. And I believe this will be the metaverse where we spend our daily lives. Uh, it requires lightweight and stylish eyewear, which is a little bit harder than than VR headsets, but it will happen. And, and I believe it will replace the mobile phone as the item we use to access digital content throughout our day. And, and I do think that that transition will be fully realized by 2040. Um, and and so I, I do think the metaverse is happening. I think it's happening faster than most people think because I think it will first appear primarily as the augmented metaverse. Um, I think whether it's virtual or augmented, uh, the one important thing that spans both of these issues is is that we need to start considering regulation. Uh, and I'm not talking about regulation of content. I'm not talking about regulation of users. I'm talking about regulation of platforms and platform providers. And that's because this transition from flat media to immersive experiences, by its very nature, will give metaverse platforms unprecedented power to monitor our lives and to alter the surroundings around users. And they can do both of those things without us, the public, even realizing it. And so in, in order to enable immersive experiences in virtual and augmented worlds, the platforms will need to track everything about our lives. They'll need to track where we go, what we do, who we're with, what direction we're looking, how long our gaze is lingering, how fast we're walking, where we slow down, what store windows we glance in, what products we pick up off the shelves. They could potentially track everything. And if there's no regulation, they could profile everything. Uh, they'll also be able to track our facial expressions, our vocal inflections, our posture, even our vital signs, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, eye motions. And they'll be able to use this to accurately predict our emotions. This means that, that platforms will not just know everything that we're doing during our lives, they'll know exactly how we feel while we're doing it. <laughs> and and how we react to thousands of little encounters we have every day. And this, this type of behavioral and emotional data could be exploited to create detailed profiles that can predict our daily lives and our reactions to almost everything. And so this is, this is scary, and it's not just a privacy issue. It's not just a privacy issue because advertising and persuasion in the metaverse, it's not going to be flat content like ads and videos. It's going to be immersive experiences that are engaged all around us. It will be virtual product placements that are injected into our world to subtly influence our perspective. It'll be virtual spokespeople that are AI avatars that engage us in promotional conversation. And in both cases, we might not be able to tell the difference between an authentic experience that we just happen to serendipitously encounter in the, in the virtual metaverse or the augmented metaverse or a targeted promotional experience that's placed into our surroundings to influence us. And so for those reasons, I really strongly believe that policymakers need to consider guardrails that will allow us to trust the authenticity of our experiences in the metaverse. And to me, this means, you know, at, at the very minimum rules that require promotionally altered experiences to look and sound different so that we know what is promotional and what is authentic. And without that, I don't, I don't think there's a way to have trust in the metaverse. Um, and again, I'm a proponent of the metaverse. I've, I've been pushing for immersive worlds for 30 years, and I, I believe that it has a, a really big potential for good. I, I think it can be a deeply humanizing technology that allows us to access information in the form that our perceptual system was meant to receive it as first-person experiences. And this can le unleash, you know, Un unbelievable magical magical applications, but we need to also protect against the downsides and do it quickly or we could end up tainting the metaverse and making it a place that, that nobody trusts because they can't even trust what's real and what's not real. So, Wow. I'm rolling my jaw up to my mouth. Um, thank you so much, Louis. Uh, now I get to welcome a friend. My research team at Pew, Andre Brock from Georgia Tech. Well, uh, in his day, in our report about this, uh, drew very 
history and how it might apply to the unfolding metaverse. So, Andre, introduce yourself and, and let us know how you're thinking about the things we're discussing. So, I'm Andre Brock. I'm an associate professor at Georgia Institute of Technology, where I teach about uh, largely digital and social media, but from a cultural and racial perspective. Uh, some folk would call it science and technology studies. Uh, my home field is a very uh, a little known field called social informatics, which investigates the, in, the implementation of computers in institutions, largely businesses, but also informal ones as well. And so from that perspective, uh, we learned from failure cases on how to understand how technology uh, makes its way into organizations and society. And it, I say failure cases in particular because in many cases, the introduction of a technology that was promised to be transformational, more productive, more effective was often led by elites who did not have to use that technology on an everyday basis, but had the power to enforce that technology's use on people who reported to them or who were consumers of the products that their company made. Right. And so from that perspective, I'm really skeptical about a metaverse happening in ways that would be, as uh, some of your, your previous speakers have mentioned, that would be equitable or useful, uh, much less immersive. So I want to thank Avi for mentioning uh, Snow Crash earlier, because Snow Crash is one of my favorite novels ever. Uh, we could talk about the merits of Neil Stevenson as an author later. Right. But there are multiple metaverses in the, the book that Stevenson wrote. Uh, back in the 90s. One of them was the one that a lot of te technologists love, uh, the one where uh, entities such as corporations, banks, and uh, other uh, institutions were represented by abstract shapes in a virtual space connected by uh, uh, a meta um, monorail that would take you around the entire information sphere. Right. But there was another one that was more banal that speaks to where we are today. And that was the role of the government employee who was surveilled on multiple levels by her employer to determine whether or not she had her eyeballs on the screen at appropriate moments, how many bathroom breaks she took, the length of her communications with her superiors and other coworkers, the content of her communication. And to me, that's what the promises about the metaverse are leading us toward, as opposed to some sort of com uh, communicative utopia where everyone will be able to have more immersive experiences. What I see instead is a uh, more segmented, more extractive set of environments and institutions that will be asked to, forced, I'm sorry, not even asked, to participate in as a matter of course. And I'm thinking of this in part because uh, I do study history to a certain extent, and I've long discussed uh, the ways in which the telephone um, was deployed across the United States. Uh, current landline usage is at 40%. 40% uh, of American households have a landline. The vast majority of people now, one or more members in a household have a cell phone. Many households are cell phone only. But when the telephone was introduced as a way to that businesses took up in order to have communication between themselves and their customers, Black folk were left out of that information uh, expansion of that information environment, right? We either shared uh, telephones and uh, one person who had the landline in their house in a neighborhood uh, or we were forced to wait around that telephone for job opportunities or to communicate with our employers, right? And that type of inequities has persisted even as more people have moved to cell phones, right? Uh, many, uh, my youngest just got her first job at McDonald's and her grandmother told her that, you know, when you go looking for jobs, you should walk house to house. I mean, business to business and get applications and show them that you're willing to work. And she laughed, my, my daughter laughed at her, which I told her wasn't a good idea, right? But she said, you know, that's not how applications work today. Many folk apply for jobs using either um, uh, websites like Indeed.com, right? Or the, the companies themselves have their own bespoke websites where the applicant walks up to a kiosk. This is the metaverse that we already exist in, where it's not necessarily augmented reality. I would still call it an extractive and exploitive reality, where people can only access on the terms that employers and the government deem necessary. I'm I'm driven to think of the ways in which um, SNAP benefits for those who, who are outside the U.S. Uh, the U.S. provides a means-tested program that provides mothers and the and poor folk with uh, uh, funds so that they can buy food and other commodities in order to live a daily life. But the U.S. moved those uh, systems to a digital system because of persistent stereotypes about 
poor people, particularly black people and fraud, right? And so these systems were moved to online systems such as debit cards and the like. And as such, they have really reduced the ways in which these folk can have any sort of agency with the type of food products they buy or use or utilize, right? So I'm rambling a little bit and I'll, I'll try to, to be brief, right? My, my overall thought is equity, as uh, the young lady mentioned earlier, is going to be a persistent problem. But I'm really uh, kind of concerned about the idea that a system such as the West, and we can add China to and other spaces to that as well, which is driven on the extraction of humanity for governmental or capitalistic uh, uh, motives, right? And then the eventual exploitation of natural resources, including people. I have trouble believing that it will provide any kind of uh, AR or VR environment that is of use to anybody but those who have the most capital, the most wealth, right? Uh, I remember uh, an interview that Bill Gates had 20 some years ago where he said he didn't even allow his children to have iPhones, right? Uh, and I see that only the people who are forced to use these systems will be encouraged to use these systems. And many more folk, uh, I just finished a class uh, where we were, I was talking with the young women about what type of social network they would want to be on. And one of their first complaints was they get interactions from older men who they don't want to have any contact with, but who are somehow enabled to have access to their personal sphere, right, through these social networks. I don't see how that would be any different with the metaverse that we build, no matter how graphically intensive it is. And I appreciate the the efforts of the last two speakers, Lewis and and um and Avi as well, right, with the efforts that you guys have done in this space. But immersion only works when you don't necessarily believe that the in the, in the that the the tools that you build uh I'm sorry. I let me let me rephrase that. Immersion really only seems to work when you believe that the tools you build are somehow better for humanity than humanity themselves, right? And I, I'll, I'll I'll be willing to joust back and forth about that if you like, but I think I'll stop there for now. I've said a lot. Hey, thanks, Andre. Uh, we're going to hear next from uh, Toby Shulrook, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, who was one of the strongest critics of the metaverse in our report. Um, so, Toby, introduce yourself and elaborate on your concerns. Hi, Lee. Thank you so much, and Jana, for inviting me into this conversation. Um, I've been working at the intersection of technology and gender-based violence for 20 years now, and more recently in the emerging area of public interest technology, or technology in service of people and planet and not just profit. Um, <clears throat> it's my sense that the metaverse has a lot of hype, a lot of momentum, uh, the previous iterations and this current one, I have concerns about it. Uh, I have concerns about the generation, the direction of technology generally. What happens when we go from always on to always in as it becomes more and more immersive? You know, I, I have loved technology since I was little. I programmed my Commodore 64. I roamed the early web. I got on social media, played around in VR. So it's not that I'm anti-technology, but I've also seen the risks and the harms as we move online from the real world, uh, whatever the real world is, it's not just one more place where messy human problems turn up. Digital technologies accelerate and amplify hate, harassment, abuse, and disparities of access, as the other speakers have, have been talking about. Um, and so I think that there's also no going backward, though. We can't go into some rear view mirror, paleo diet, idealized past with no technology. Um, harnessing technology was, uh, harnessing fire was technology. Cuneiform tablets were technology, uh, just as much as molecular gastronomy is technology today. This dichotomy between us and our technology is a false binary. Like Donna Haraway said, we're cyborgs. Our, our tech has shaped us as much as we shape our technology. There are microplastics inside me, and it was in the milk that I fed my babies, right? The shape of my bones, my height, is the result of thousands of years of agricultural technology. So I don't think that we can separate a space that is online or is the metaverse from the real world anymore. Um, I think, you know, as technologists, we can go back and forth about what those lines are, and that's important as we shape standards and laws and design technology. But for the average person who is experiencing this or who is excluded from it, that distinction is is blurry. So maybe the metaverse can give us this power or potential to move beyond false binaries, beyond the binary between physical and spiritual, real and imagined, us and our technology, 
humans and the rest of Earth, uh, beyond gender even. But not as long as the rules of the game continue to be written by the very few for the very many. Um, as others have said, like I've, I've read and I love Neil Stevenson's books and William Gibson's. I also love Ursula K. Le Guin and N.K. Jemisin and Octavia Butler, right? The worlds that we build and the futures we're envisioning need to include many voices. And we urgently need to reconfigure how we establish and maintain trust in each other, in information, perhaps even trust in ourselves. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what others have to say and, and entering into some conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Toby. Um, and now Ben Cleanup is Frank Kaufman of the 12 Gates Foundation, who sketched out a pretty elaborate evolution path for the metaverse uh, and some of the troubles that are likely to occur along the way. So hi, Frank, uh, introduce yourself and, and talk to us about what you see happening. Thank you very much. Am I audible, Lee? Yes. Oh, very good. <clears throat> Uh, I'm I'm entirely overwhelmed. This has been a treat beyond which I did not imagine listening to the previous speakers. Uh, I'm overwhelmed and uh, made new even just in these few minutes. I'm the head of 12 Gates Foundation. It's rooted in interreligious relations. My relationship with this particular work is the interface between uh, technology and technological development and private and public morality. And so my thoughts ab about the, uh, the emergence and potential of the metaverse is related to this issue of that particular interface. Uh, I believe that human beings are, are limitless in their creative capacity, and that is an unstoppable thing. I think it's deliberate about us. Uh, I think the fact that every human being has a dark side is not an original, an original intention. And so the inexorable evolution from drudgery to absolute creativity, that happens by its natural, by its natural force of technological development. But tragically, uh, moral, morality and virtue has, does not keep a pace with the inevitability of technological development. So I believe that regardless of how, and some of the commentary here this afternoon has been positively frightening for me to listen to, uh, but that notwithstanding, and the warnings we've had from every speaker, uh, nevertheless, nothing will stop, nothing will stop this technology from advancing as far as it possibly can and, and even beyond what we might imagine. So if we, if we look at the progress from drudgery, namely working to survive toward the liberation of creativity, namely working to create, what we, what we end up with obviously are creators and consumers. And what we end up with is instruction and entertainment. So basically creators are producing instruction and entertainment and consumers are seeking either one or both, either or seek both, uh, but at any one time seeking either one of these two things. So the dark side of the dark side of that reality is that we don't only just come up with a greater capacity to instruct and inform and a greater capacity to learn and grow, or a greater capacity, or a greater capacity to create uh, entertainment that's more wondrous, more vaunting, more vaulting, uh, more uh, delightful. Not only do we create both and consume both, but likewise, the dark side of human reality is that the instruction we create can be more profoundly and perfectly demonic in its capacity. And the entertainment we create likewise, similarly, and the, and the, and the, in, and the instruction and the information we seek likewise can either seek to uh, 
um, enhance our glory or to degrade us to the depths of depravity. So we can seek instruction on how to amplify a demonic or dysphoric side of ourselves. We can seek entertainment, and this has been alluded to, that is positively degrading and abusive. So my, my view on the matter is, and I appreciate every speaker uh, anticipating this, recognizing this, and, and uh, even acting to create such things as the XR Guild. And uh, I think it was Lewis that spoke about uh, the, int- the urgent need for uh, regulation on platforms and so forth. But my, my view is that what's additionally needed are systems that are capable of forging virtue and morality in individuals. I, I don't believe it can be regulated. I believe that what once functioned as classical, classical religious and spiritual obligations on people, these were where they started or were able to keep in check the uh, the departure from the basic humane uh, uh, qualities that we need with which we need to treat one another, as several of the speakers has also pointed out. And so the the rear view mirror that uh, I believe it was Toby that just mentioned, it's it's not available t- in technology. It's also not available in spiritual and religious life. So if we look at, the radical force, the radical, uh, the the juggernaut, or the speed at which technolo- technology is developing, there needs to be developed likewise systems for the creation of virtue that is every bit co- not competes with, but is every bit as exquisite, as masterful, as as uh, remarkable. In its, in its capacity to speak to the human being as a spiritual entity while all this is happening. I don't believe it can stop, be stopped, and I don't believe that regulation has the capacity to hold in check uh, the reproduction of both incredible good and incredible evil. The last thing I'd like to say is that one of the, one of the good models, I think, when we're looking at the dangers of, uh, of um, the metaverse and AR and VR and so forth, the dangers is that if we shift our look away from ourselves and as the object of the dangers, but rather to the ones we love as the ones endangered, how, how, how do I feel as, as um, who is it, um, Lewis, as Lewis described, every single the capacity to know every single thing about our lives. Now, that's, that's horrible for myself. But how do I feel about my, that happening to my wife all the time or to my young daughter all the time? How do I feel in my confidence to create the capacity for intimacy with my conjugal partner over against the amount of the, the, in, the subtlety of knowing everything about that's uh, about my partner in excess of what I'm capable of doing while I'm trying to live my life, survive my life, and so forth. So I think part of the additional way of enhancing our determination or or our pursuit of having moral and virtue uh, 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 building within human beings is adding this this net of of where our passions lie it's kind of like take my life but don't touch my child and so if that can be added into how we are considering how to protect the human experience the genuine experience uh over against the emergence of uh what will what will happen in what's even even greater and harder than much of which has been introduced already thanks very much for a few moments to speak Wow, what a rich and varied conversation. And thank you so much, everyone. Uh, We want to stop 
our um, our Twitter Spaces event around four o'clock. So I'm, I'm going to go through a lightning round of, in, of commentary now on the on the final question here. One of the themes that runs through almost all of your answers is the almost inevitable uh, commercial domination of the metaverse, or at least uh, you know big presence and and big influence. So can you talk relatively quickly about how much commercial interests will extend their power and influence in the metaverse and, and um, what some of the responses maybe from civil society might be? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Lewis to go first, and then I'm going to ask other speakers who uh, want to address that question to uh, raise their hands, and we'll get to you. Uh, sure. So, I mean, unfortunately, I think the metaverse will be highly commercial uh, because most of the entities that are working to build the metaverse right now are doing it for commercial reasons. Um, and I think that, that if it's not regulated, then um, we have to really worry about what the implications are. And, you know, we can learn from social media, which also emerged very much as a commercial uh, activity. And because of that, the, the large platforms basically made their business tracking, profiling, and targeting people on a massive scale. And, and we've seen this as polarized populations, um, pulling people into different information bubbles, driving misinformation. In the metaverse, the commercial, the commercial powers, uh, the business models could drive the exact same thing. But instead of driving people into their own information bubbles, it could drive people into their own polarized separate realities and uh, and so people will uh, people will see informational content that the um, the platforms think will in drive the most engagement and the things that they that they want to see and and we could basically see you know two parallel metaverses or multiple parallel metaverses where people are seeing completely different things I could be walking down the same street in the same world and I could see political messaging that makes me think that my community believes one thing about an issue and somebody could be walking down that same street next to me and see the exact opposite messaging and think their community uh, believes something else. And, and so it's the, the same commercially driven problems that we've seen from, from social media could leap off the screen and just be spread all over the real world. And, and again, it goes back to, you know, we need regulation and we need regulation that, that helps contain the business models. And, uh, and Avi said this, you know, at the, at the very start, um, and I totally agree, which is the, the, it's not the technology that needs to be regulated. It's, it's the business models and it's, uh, it's containing these commercial pressures so that they're not motivated to, to track and profile and, and manipulate uh, their user base. Wow, thank you so much. Hey, hey, Kelly, can I put you on the spot and maybe think about that same question about the commercialization of the metaverse? Yeah, I can be very brief. Um, the problem is we often have commercial entities being regulated by people who have connections to commercial enterprise, even our politicians. And so I think we would need to do something fundamentally different where we have, you know, community members, health practitioners, doctors, you know, people who are concerned about equity concerns, also somehow advising this, this huge expansion and having people who don't have profit as their for, first motivation at the table. Hey, thanks so much. Avi, you want to go next? Hello, Avi? There we go. Sorry, I had an interface problem. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to be really brief. I, I think for the proponents of this technology, I think it's, it's pretty clear that only the big companies, the big vested interests, even have the ability to do this right now um, because it requires massive vertical integration, hardware, algorithms, operating systems, software experiences, distribution channels. They're the only ones that can pull it off for better or worse, but... I think the positive side is, given a few years, we'll see the same thing that happened with PCs and Macs and now tablets, and that when there's a normalization, we're, we're going to get to see the more open source world rise up. When, when the devices are more or less equal, then we're going to be able to see a much more um, equitable world develop on top of the hardware layers that are going to be very proprietary uh, and very much walled gardens. And the walled gardens never last. They're there initially to 
because there's no content outside because it's a desert. And then they're there because they'll claim it's a jungle, but, but everybody leaves the wall gardens eventually and goes out and, and, and meets each other in the world. It's just a question of what kind of world do we want to build by that point? So that's all I have. Thank you so much. Uh, Andre, how about you? On the commercialization question and general distribution I, power. I am uh, only concerned about the commercialization in the sense that I am concerned about places like uh, Cambridge Analytica or Palantir uh, or at and right, which gathers the information that they uh, do from, or uh, who's the new one, the one that scraped all the social media sites, um, that they gather all this information that people generate in the course of their daily lives, their data exhaust or whatever, and then claim that they can build profiles of actual people. And I'm concerned about it because uh, I think about the experiences of my students with uh, proctoring systems uh, and how these proctoring systems are designed ostensibly to get them to be model citizens as they're taking a test, but do all sorts of intrusive things to monitor whether or not they're actually uh, being a model citizen, such as eye tracking, room uh, evaluation, uh, skin color uh, <laughs> uh, evaluation, and the like. And so any possibilities that the commercial entities will have are already fully structured by the ways that governments and other uh, institutions like non-governmental institutions are already asking these companies to configure us in ways that fit these extractive models. Uh, so again, I'm super pessimistic on a different, a slightly different register. Toby, how about you? Yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, I think that rightly so, we've been talking about concerns around surveillance capitalism, as Jana mentioned at the beginning, and state surveillance, uh, dark patterns, these are all problematic on the societal level. And those same motivations, omniscience and coercion, turn up in one-on-one -on -one abuse. So the societal level mirrors abuses on the individual level. I, I think that also comes into how we place responsibility for what to do about it, right? It, and so far online, that mirrors the real world. We put the burden on potential victims of abuse. We put the responsibility on individual consumers um, but really, the responsibility is on the person doing harm when you're talking about abusive situations. And and to uh, tag back to something that Avi said at the very beginning, and this is really crucial, that creators of virtual spaces, designers, are creating the conditions in which either these things that we don't want, abuse, hate, disinformation, exploitation, surveillance, can flourish, or they're designing spaces which could promote safety, care, and community. So I think it's it's on designers and it's on platforms to be intentional and uh, in the in the public interest when it comes to how they set up these spaces. Thank you so so much. And Frank, I'm going to give you the last word on the subject. Thanks very much. Um, I would I, my only concern is that well, profit seeking in and of itself is not a bad thing. It makes it creates the possibility to advance and, and improve. And uh, so I'm, and regulatory powers are not necessarily always the good guys. The problem is the corruptibility on both sides of that equation. And so as we're looking for ways to kind of protect ourselves from the dangers or from the dark side of these developments, it's just one of the areas that I think needs to be considered is the corruptibility of both sides of the equation as well as oftentimes the collaboration in which uh, now, now regulators are bought and profit seekers are in control in one way or another. So this is just a, a relationship and a way of uh, gazing at, at the corrections or protections we're hoping to uh, have in place is an, another, another point of, uh, of careful consideration, careful observation. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Um, Jana and I have been doing this work for 18 years. We've written 41 reports off these expert canvassings about the future. And I've got to say the one that we talked about today, first of all, was incredibly well represented by the panelists who spoke. Um, and it was one of the best ones we'd ever done. I, th I think it was, it set an agenda and a framing for a big issue 
uh, it's looming in our future that, um, you know, we, I think we did it. We captured a lot of great smart voices in this and a lot of great smart enthusiasm. Uh, we posted the, all 41 reports uh, in a link in the chat if people want to see it. We're also going to uh, make this uh, audio available. We'll point you to it. who came and I'm, you know, a hand over heart. I'm, I'm loving the people who um, were speaking today. Thank you so, so very much. And Isaac, um, back to you to close us out. All right. Thank you, Lee. Um, I would just like to thank all of our experts for participating. Thank you, Jen and Lee, for coordinating and for co-hosting. And thank you all for listening. If you'd like to read more from this canvassing that we were talking about discussing today, you can find it at pewresearch.org slash future of the metaverse.